All right, it's four o'clock. Let's so let's uh, go ahead and get started. All right, good afternoon, everyone. How's uh how's everyone doing today? Good, hanging in there. But I'm sure it's a busy time. I'm sure you guys have uh, midterm exams and, and everything going on. So I you know, appreciate you guys being here. Uh, okay, so today uh, the plan is uh, we're just gonna do we're just gonna do all examples today. So we're not gonna cover any new information. Uh, we're just gonna do more practice with the simplex method. So you know, last time we were in class last Thursday, uh, we did a very very lengthy example with the simplex method. It took us almost an hour to do so. Um, and so I wanted to get some more practice. Uh, you know, uh, just to kind of show you that it it doesn't it shouldn't take you an hour to do to do these problems. Um, they're actually you know quite fast once you kind of get used to them. And so we're gonna do three examples today, uh, two from the notes, and then uh, one homework problem actually. So I got I did get a request for problem three B on homework three, um, and so we'll do that one together um, in class today. So we'll probably we'll probably end with the homework problem. Okay. Um, and so you know ho hopefully after today you'll you'll have some more confidence doing the simplex method because it's uh, we 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 took a while last time just because there was a lot to kind of explain with every step. Uh, but once you know, once you kind of get packed with it, it, it gets it gets a lot faster. Okay, and so the other uh, big announcement that I want to make this week is uh, for the midterm exam. So our midterm exam is planned for Tuesday, October tenth. Uh, so that's a week from today. Okay. Uh, so just uh, some just so just some information about the exam. Um, right now, I'm planning to have four conceptual questions, and so. Uh, the conceptual questions are going to be basically short answer questions. And so you're going to answer them with maybe two or three or four sentences, maybe a picture, uh, or maybe I'll give you a picture and you have to interpret the uh, the picture, uh, something something of that variety. And so you'll have four of those. Uh, so that'll constitute about 40% of the points on the exam. And then the other 60% of the points will be three optimization type problems. So, um, and so, you know, we've, we've covered kind of three big kind of areas. So we talked about unconstrained optimization using the classical method, constrained optimization using the classical method and linear programming. So you can, you can probably expect one problem from each area uh, on that. Okay, so that's uh, basically homework two and homework three, uh, the optimization problems. And then the conceptual problems will pull kind of from everything that we talked about. Um, but, you know, we, I do have a study guide that, that'll be there to help you, which we'll talk about. Okay. All right, in terms of what you can bring, uh, you can bring a pencil or a pen, kind of whatever you feel most comfortable with. Uh, as long as it's legible, it's, it's anything's okay with me. Um, definitely bring a calculator. And so, uh, you know, with the optimization problem, there's going to be a lot of calculations. And so, you know, bring a calculator to help uh, speed that up and make sure that you can uh, compute those things, um, you know, quickly without wasting too much time is important. Uh, and probably most importantly, um, you can bring a sheet of notes. And so, your sheet of notes can be one eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. Uh, you can write on both sides. Uh, you can write it, you can type it. Uh, you know, whatever you think is, is most helpful for you. Okay. So generally with the sheet of notes, what I recommend is to kind of really spend a good amount of time writing that sheet of notes. And so the idea with that sheet of notes is that you're, you could, you're going to use it to kind of condense basically all the information that we've talked about in the last, uh, you know, six or seven weeks of class. Um, and so that means kind of going to each section, each lecture notes and kind of seeing, you know, what's the most important thing, what's the most important formulas, What's the most important definitions for me to write down on that uh, on that sheet of notes? Okay. Uh, what I've seen before in the past is people taking literally taking my lecture notes and kind of squishing it down to kind of like you know itty, itty bitty font size and putting screenshots of those on the on the cheat sheet and printing that out. Uh, so you can do that. You know, I'm not going to stop you, but uh, you know those uh, those people usually aren't that successful um, historically. So. Uh, I think what's better is to kind of, you know, read the notes yourselves, process the notes, and kind of write down what you think is most important on your sheet. Um, and then that kind of helps you study as well, because, you know, that process of kind of rereading the notes and kind of processing the information and condensing it uh, is a great, is an excellent way to study. So, uh, so don't, you know, don't, don't, don't brush off the cheat sheet. So people think, you know, I'll, I'll just fill it in last minute or, you know, I'll, I'll just copy my friend's cheat sheets. Uh, you know, really take the time and, and really kind of, you know, put some effort in, in making that. And, and I guarantee you, it will help you a lot. For this. Okay. okay. And so in terms of what to study, um, you know, I always tell people the first, the, for your first thing to study should always be the homework problems. Um, and so I write my homework. So I write all my homework problems from scratch. I write my, uh, my exam problems from scratch too. And so the exam problems are going to be in the exact same style as the homework problems that you've seen. Uh, except the exam problem will be a little bit easier uh, just because of the time time limited nature of the exam. And so, you know, you're not going to, I'm not going to, you know, ask you to do a, a problem that's going to take you 45 minutes because that's, okay, that's basically the whole exam period. Okay. 
And so start with the homework problems. And I always tell people that if you can do the homework problems without looking at the solutions um, and you can get the right answer, then, then you're going to be in excellent shape. Okay. Because what people tend to do when you when you study the homework problems, because I, I, I post the solutions for the homeworks, is that you know you people tend to study the homework problems and they have the solutions kind of right in front of them. So they kind of just end up just copying the solutions. Um, so you know that's that's not really that useful because when you kind of you end up kind of almost tricking yourself and thinking like, oh, I have this problem, here's the solution. It's like, oh yeah, you know, I I, I knew that after you, after you read the solution, right? It's very easy, you know, um, and and you see this a lot just in in uh, just in general. So you know, it's very easy to look at the final score of like football game. Oh yeah, you know, Chargers going to win this game. Uh, but you know, that's not that's not always clear when you're actually going. Through. You're redoing the homework problems. Try to do them without looking at the solution, and then only look at the solution after you've completed the problem, and then you know, then go back and and, and correct your mistakes. And I find that's yeah. All right. So the other uh, resource that I've uh, provided to you is a study guide. And so if you look on the Canvas page under Week Seven, uh, you should see that I posted kind of a new PDF at the bottom of the page. And so that PDF is the study guide. So the study guide is simply just a summary of all the learning objectives that we've covered so far. But you know, when you're studying the conceptual uh, information, the conceptual learning objectives, uh, the study guide is kind of a great way to kind of organize. Them, okay? And if you'll if you'll notice, uh, you know, if, if you haven't taken me before as an instructor, you know, I, I've written the study guide in a certain way to kind of you know make each uh, item on the study guide as if it were an exam question. Okay. Um, so the exam questions are not going to be exactly what I put on the study guide, but they're going to be pretty close. And so if you can go through the study guide and if you can answer all the questions on the study guide, uh, you know, find the answers in the notes and things like that, uh, and you really kind of understand that from a, you know, on, on a level, then that's kind of the best thing that you can do to prepare for this. Okay. And in fact, you know, I, I think just because, you know, I have kind of quite a few first time students here, let me go ahead and share kind of what the study guide is. Okay, so you're going to go to our uh, our page here. You're going to go to week seven, and then you can see here that uh, I have a page here for uh, midterm one study. Okay. And so if you read the study guide, you can see here that I've broken it down into the, into the different sections that we've gone over uh, in the class. And you can see here that I, I've written each learning objective as if it were a problem. Right? And so you, know, I could, I, you can definitely imagine me you know, making a, a question on the exam to say, you know, define optimization and, uh, to, and explain what an optimization software code is to achieve. Right? Um, and so same thing kind of for everything here. So, you know, I always tell people that, you know, if, if, when you're preparing for the conceptual information on the exam, you know, use this uh, as a guide and actually answer these questions. So I, I've seen people actually, you know, copy this, copy this problem down and actually type out answers to these questions. And those people always do really, really well. On this, okay? uh, so it's a lot. And so, you know, and, and I realize that it's, it, it would be a lot of work to kind of all this, but, you know, we've covered a lot of content. So we've, we've done a lot in this class up to this point. So. Um, you know, definitely looking at these uh, learning objectives. Maybe maybe you don't answer every single one, but at least you know uh, read them and kind of try to understand what they're asking for, and at least kind of go over what a solution would look like in your head, and then that would be kind of the best way to kind of prepare for it. Okay. And then at the bottom of the study guide, I have kind of the problem solving learning objectives, and so this is kind of a summary of the types of problems or the types of skills that I would want you to know or to be able to demonstrate on the exam. So definitely take a look at the study guide. Definitely take a look at your old homeworks. I think that those are kind of the best ways to study for this. Okay. All right. Any questions on the exam uh, next week? All right. And so, of course, you know, um, if you if you have any questions, and so you know, if, if you're not sure about you know what the learning objective is asking for, or you want me to look over some problems that you're working on. Um, you know, definitely, definitely feel free to come to office hours. And so I have office hours. I have three more until the exam. And so I have office hours tomorrow at 530. 
Um, I have office hours on Thursday from one to two. And then I have one last office hours before the exam on Tuesday morning. From nine to 10. Okay, so definitely make use of those. Uh, if those times don't work for you, you can always email me and then we can set up a time. Uh, either, you know, e either I can answer your question over email. You know, a lot of times I'm going to do that. Uh, but if it requires kind of a longer explanation, we can set up a time outside of office hours. Okay, all right, so uh, so that's the exam. So let's go ahead and come back here. And by the way, today today is the cutoff. So after today, um, you know, there's no more content after today is gonna be on the exam. So after today, today is kind of the, the cutoff. So Thursday, Thursday, we're gonna start something new. Uh, Thursday, we're gonna start to review MATLAB, uh, but none of the MATLAB stuff is gonna be on the exam. So after, after 5.15 today, you know, none, none, nothing more I say after 5.15 today is going to be gone. Okay. All right, so let's, uh, so let's go ahead and do a few more examples. So what we were covering last Thursday was this idea of the simplex algorithm. So the simplex algorithm is uh, the primary method that we're going to use to solve our linear program. And so remember, you know, the types of problems or the types of optimization problems that we're looking at uh, in this unit are ones where the objective function and the constraints are all linear equations, right? And so linear meaning that the coefficients, or excuse me, the, uh, all the design variables show up as linear terms. So the coefficients are just one, okay? Or the exponents are just one. And the basic idea with the simplex algorithm is that, you know, because we can represent our system as a you know, system of, of linear equations, you know, our optimal solution or the way that we can find our optimal solution is just kind of transitioning from one basic solution to the next. Because whenever you have a system of linear equations and you have more variables than unknowns, right, which is always going to be the case for an optimization problem, right? For an optimization problem, you have more design variables than constraints. Okay? Um, you're always going to have, you know, uh, when you when you simplify the system through pivoting operations, you're always going to have a set of basic variables and a set of non-basic. And, you know, we went over the definition for basic variables and non-basic variables last week, you know, but basically kind of the upshot, at least in terms of, uh, or kind of the most important thing to consider when you're doing the simplex algorithm, that our basic variables or their, their values at the end are going to be non-zero. And then our non-zero basic variables are going to be zero. And so deciding which variables or which uh, design variables in our optimization problem are going to have non-zero values and which design variables are going to be uh, zero, you know, that's the whole idea with the simplex. Okay. And then, you know, basically what we're going to do is we're going to rotate basically you know, which variables are going to be non-zero, which can be zero, and then finding which one gives us the most optimal.
So this is the whole idea of the syntax. So when you boil it down like that, you know, it's, it's, you know, hopefully, hopefully not too difficult to understand, right? So, you know, we're trying to find out which variables, which variables in our system are best as non-zero that gives us an optimal solution, okay? Uh, it's just, you know, along the way, there's so many little rules and so many little, uh, you, know, um, you know, best practices, so many, so many little, you know, things that you have to keep in, keep in track of where, you know, it looks like there's a lot of steps that you're, that you're doing. But as you kind of do these kind of more and more, you know, these steps kind of become more intuitive and it becomes easier to kind of determine, you know, what to do in these situations. Okay. All right. And so I'll, I'll go ahead and refer to, you know, the example we did last time to, uh, uh, you know, to go over all of those exact rules. But let's go ahead and do a, a couple more examples today. Uh, and then you know, we'll go a lot faster so that you can kind of see, um, you know, how this all works. And I think through the examples today, you're going to see some, some interesting situations that can occur uh, through the simplex method. Okay. Because you know, we, we talked about this maybe about 10 days ago, so I think not last week before, that the result of a linear programming problem actually has quite a few different outcomes. Um, and we're going to see what that actually looks like mathematically. Okay, so let's start with a fairly simple example. So let's say we want to minimize the following function. And We'll do a 2D optimization. So we're going to have two design variables. So f of x1 and x2 is equal to 3x1 minus 2x2. Let's go ahead and state our constraints. So the first constraint is x1 minus x2 must be less than or equal to 1. 3x1. Is less than or equal to and just so like all linear programming problems, you know, we're going to assume that all of our uh, variables are non negative. We're going to say that x1 is greater than or equal to zero and x2 is greater than or equal to zero. Okay. We don't explicitly enforce this throughout the problem solving procedure, but we just we just kind of have to remember that you know our linear programming problems they they enforce non zero. Okay, so not too bad here. So, so mathematically, it looks at least simpler than what we did uh, last Thursday. And in fact, you know, we our, our problem here is already in standard form. So we have a minimization problem, first of all. Um, so our f of x and y, you don't want to minimize that, so it's good. And all of our inequality constraints here are less than or equal to, so already in standard form. That's good. We're off to a good start. Um, but before we actually start applying the simplex method, we have to transform all of the inequality constraints to equality constraints. And the way that we do that is we add slack variables to each of the inequality constraints. Because the simplex method only works with equality constraints. Okay, so that means our first constraint here, x1 minus x2, is less than or equal to 1. This is going to be transformed to x1 minus x2. And we're going to add a new design variable here. So we're going to add x3. So x3 is our slack variable, and then it, it becomes one of our, our variables here. And so now we have x1 minus x2 plus x3 is equal to 1. X one, X two, X two. 
the letter is equal to six. Let's add another slack variable here. So we have three x one plus two x two plus x four two six. Right, now let me write down the objective function again. So our objective function is minus three x one plus two x two minus f equal to So what I have in braces right here, that is the, that's our linear opt linear programming uh, optimization problem. Uh, but now we have four design variables instead of just two. Any questions on, on this so far? Okay. All right, so let's so let's uh, so let's start. So our, our first step here, now that we have the the system in this form, so we have all equality constraints um, and everything's in standard form, is we need to find our first kind of initial basic solution. The way that we're going to do that is we're going to do it just by inspection. Okay. All right. And so for these problems, actually with inequality constraints and and, you and where you have to add slack variables, um, is actually quite nice because we can find our initial basic solution by just by inspection. Okay. Because if you look at um, if you look at our two constraint equations, right? We look at x three. X three only shows up in the first constraint, and if we look at x four. X4 only shows up in the second constraint. Okay? And so one basic, and so one solution to this uh, problem is that if we set if we set our original design variables to zero, We're going to set x1 and x2 equal to zero. What we can do from there is we can solve for the values for x3 and x4 uh, very, very easily. Okay. Because if x1 is equal to zero, x1 is going to go away. In this equation, x2 is going to go away. And so this gives us x3 is equal to one. And that comes from the first constraint. And then from the second constraint, we're going to cancel out x1 and x2 again. And we get x4 equal to six. Okay. And this works. And so this is a uh, this is a solution to this uh, set of equations uh, that we found kind of very, very easy. Okay. All right. And so for so the for the purposes of this class, you know, you can you can always kind of assume that you can find an, an initial basic solution this way. There is there is a method to finding an initial basic solution when you when it's not so easy to determine, um, but you know we're 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 going to kind of skip over that just so we can kind of uh, move on to the math next. Time, okay, and so for all intents and purposes, you know this should always kind of be the first step in your linear programming um, problems in this class, which is you know take your original design variables, set them equal to zero, and then just all the new slack variables that we added in, those take on their their values. As well. So, so this set of variables right here, x1 is equal to zero, x2 is equal to zero, x3 is equal to one, and x6 is x4 is equal to six. This is our initial solution. Okay. And then what we can further say what we can further say is that since x1 and x2 are both equal to zero, we can then label those as our non-basic variables. X3 and X4, we can label those as our basic variables because those have non-zero uh, non-zero values. Okay. Okay. 
And in this particular case, you know, because we have four variables and two, basically two equations, the, the objective function doesn't really count as an equation. Um, so since we have two equations and four unknowns, we're going to have two basic variables and two non basic variables. Okay. okay. So technically, this is a solution. So this, so what we have right here is a solution to this linear system. The problem is, is that it's not up. Two. Step two of our, of our simplex algorithm is to check check and see if this solution is optimal, and if not, perform a pivot. And so the way that we're going to check if this solution is optimal is we're going to check our objective function. All right, so let me come back up here. Let me go ahead and highlight the objective function. Remember, our objective function is negative 3x1 minus 2x2. Uh, and I just moved the f to the other side, so minus f is equal to 0. Okay. And remember, what we're checking for is that we're checking for any negative coefficients. Because a negative coefficient will tell us that our objective function can be improved if one of these variables were non-zero. So if any of the coefficients of the objective function is negative, it's true. improve the objective function by, by basically promoting those, uh, those values. Because okay. right now, our objective function basically has a value of zero, right? Because we have x1 is equal to zero, x2 is equal to zero. That means f is also equal to zero. Okay. But since we have a negative 3x1 and negative 2x2, right? If x1 or x2, doesn't matter which one, were to take some kind of non-zero value, that means f value is going to, f's value is going to improve because that would make f more negative. And so in this case, we can we have two options. Basically. Both x1 and x2 have a negative coefficient. And so we can either improve the objective function by promoting x1, or we can improve the objective function by promoting x2. And so you have a choice. Technically, you can do either, um, and you're, eventually you're going to arrive at the same solution. But you know, usually we want to do the least amount of work, and so usually we pick the we pick the variable that has, that has the most negative coefficient. And so in this case, the most negative coefficient belongs to x one, which is minus x three. Okay. So let's promote x three, or x one. I'm sorry. Promote x one. The reason we're doing that is because it's coefficient. Okay, so negative three is, is more negative. Okay. So that's step two. So in step two, we, we know that we can improve our objective function. 
And the way we're going to do that is by promoting X1 into the basis. All right, step three. Step three is to determine which variable, which basic variable we're going to kick out of the basis. This case, our basic set right now is consists of X3 and X4. So we're either going to kick out X3 or X4. Uh, and so to do that, we need to write down our, our two constraints. So then we have, we have our X3 equation. Okay, so the X3 equation is the one that involves X3. So it's X1 minus X2 plus X3 is equal to 1. And then we have our x4 equation, which is 3x1 minus 2x2 plus x4 equals 6. Okay. And so, you know, we, we know that we're promoting x1. So x2. You know, for all intents and purposes, we're just going to ignore because x. We know x two is going to stay at zero, okay? at least in this step. And so we're either going to make x three a zero or x four zero. So if you remember from last week, you know, when, when we're doing this and we're making the decision of which variable to pick out, we want to do it in the way that's going to preserve all our constraints. Okay. And the main constraint that we're worried about here is making sure that all our variables are still not negative. Okay. All right. So let's see. And so if we make X3 zero. And using this equation here, we get X1 to one. Okay. And then from the second equation here, if we make x4 is equal to zero, and we solve that expression for x1, we get x1 is equal to two. Okay. Right. And so if you remember from last week, you know, generally what you want to do is you want to choose the choose the path that leads to the least um, you know, the smallest value for our new variable. And so in this case, it's going to be the top. Set x1 is equal to 1, um, and then we're going to set x3 is equal to 2. Okay. Because imagine that we pick the second path, right? And so imagine that we pick the second path of setting x4 is equal to 0 and setting x1 is equal to 2. Okay. If x1 is equal to 2, and we plug that into our top expression right there, okay, in order for that equation to be satisfied, that means x3, and so our equation there is going to be 2 plus x3 is equal to 1. Okay. We subtract 2 from both sides, and we get x3 is equal to minus one, okay? which is going to violate our constraint of having non-negative values. Okay? And so the only one here that makes it work is, is the first path setting x3 is equal to zero and x1 is equal to zero. So that was step three. So step so you know at this point we know what variable we're going to promote. We know what variable we're going to kick out. 
And now we're just kind of kind of cleaning up the entire system to kind of account for this. Okay. So that so the next step is to pivot around x1 and eliminate it from the other equations. Okay, so now x1 is a basic variable, and so it should only show up in just in just one of the equations. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. And so remember when we pivot for something, we're going to solve for its value. Okay. And so using our first equation here, we have x1 minus x2 plus x3 equal to 1. We solve for x1 to get x1 is equal to 1 plus x2 minus x3. Okay. So let's go ahead and plug this into the other equation and the objective function. All right, so we do that. We plug this into the x4 equation. I'm just going to go ahead and skip to the results. Okay. Just in the interest of time. So we do that. We get x2 minus 3x3 plus x4 plus 3. So we have this equation. We have this equation. And then our new objective function. The objective function is the following. So we have minus 5x2 plus 3x3 minus f is equal to 2. Okay. For now, x2 and x3 are the non basic functions. Hey, per <clears throat> Professor, I have a question. Professor? All right, any questions on, any questions on this? Okay. All right, so that's step four. Step four. Step five. Step five is return to step two. And so this is kind of when it starts to get a little bit repetitive, okay? And so in step two, let's kind of scroll back up here, okay? In step two, we're going to check if the solution is optimal, okay? And the way we're going to do that is we're going to check for negative coefficients in our new objective function, okay? And so let's look at our new objective function. So our new objective function is minus 5x2 um, plus 3x3 minus f is equal to 3, okay? We have a negative coefficient here, and we have minus 5x2. And so that tells us we can improve the solution even more by promoting X2. Okay, so let's kind of run through the whole the whole process again. Okay, so we know we want to promote um, X2. Let's go ahead and go to step three. So I'm going to call this step 3A because it's the second rendition of step. Okay. And so remember in step three, we're going to, we're going to determine which variable we're going to kick out of the basic set. And so right now we have two variables in the basic set. It's either x1 or x4. So let me write down their equations uh, again here. 
So our X1 equation is what we have here circled first. And so we have X1 minus X2, that's X3, one. X4 equation is we have X2, minus three, X3, that's X4 equal two. All right, so same thing before, X3 is staying in the, in the non-basic set, so we can just assume that that's zero. So let's go ahead and eliminate that. Okay. And so let's go ahead and run through um, both scenarios here. And so if we kick out X1, so kicking out X1 means uh, we're saying X1 is equal to zero. We solve our equation here for X2, so get X2 is equal to minus one. Okay. And if we kick out X4, We take out x4, so we're setting x4 is equal to zero, then we get x2 is equal to three. Okay. So there's only one viable option here, which is the second path. Okay. Because remember, we can't have any non-negative values for the design variables. Okay. And so our only path is to set x4 is equal to zero and set x2 is equal to three. Okay, so now that we determined we're gonna kick out X4, let's go ahead and adjust our equations to, to account for this, okay? All right, so let's go ahead and pivot around X2. And remember what that means is to eliminate it from all the other equations. So let's start with the equation that I have here. So we have x2, x3, x3, plus x4, x3, okay. We solve this for x2. Solve this for x2, what we get is x2 is equal to three plus three x3 plus four. Let's go ahead and plug this into the other equations. So we plug it into the first equation, our first equation x1 minus x2 plus x3 to 1. And so we plug in for x2 into this equation. It is x1 minus 3 plus 3x3 three three minus x4 plus x3 into 1. And so if we work through the algebra here, what we get is x1 is 2x3 plus x4 equals 4. Equation is given by this. And then if we plug it into our objective function, We plug it into our objective function. What we get is minus 12 x3 plus 5 x4 minus f equal to Any questions on, on how we got uh, how we got here? All right. So that is uh, our second go around. Okay. 
So now we kind of hit the bottom again. So let's go ahead and return to step two. And so let's look at our objective function. And so we have a negative coefficient here. We have a negative uh, 12 x3. Okay. And so we have a negative coefficient. And so that means that this problem can be improved. Okay. Mm -hmm. But we're going to stop here. Okay. And, and we're going to stop here for kind of a very good reason. Uh, not only because I'm, I'm, I mean, for the, for the main part, I'm getting tired of this problem. So, you know, we're going to get, we're going to stop. But, you know, actually, we, we actually can't continue any further. Um, or maybe the better way to say it, we can actually continue a lot further um, and we can improve this even more, okay? What do, I, what do I mean by that? And so, you know, let's look at our, our other two equations that we have here. And so if you look at these other two equations, the coefficient in front of x3 in both of these equations is negative, right? First, let me write down, we can improve by increasing the value of x3. Because right now, technically, x3 is assumed to be zero because it's a non-basic variable, okay? But All the other coefficients for x3 in the other equations are negative. Okay. What does this mean? So this means that if we were to increase the value for x3, okay, and so let's say that you know we set it kind of arbitrary, so we say x3 is equal to you know 50 or something like that. Okay. That means that if if we do that, then you know we're not in danger of violating any of the other constraints. Most notably, you know, we're not, you know, we can increase the value of x3 without fear of causing the other um, variables to go negative, okay? Because remember, you know, the non-basic variables, you know, we normally we set them equal to zero um, just because that's, that's kind of the most convenient. But we technically don't have to set them equal to zero because the non-basic variables are arbitrary, okay? Technically, we can set them to be whatever we want. Usually, we set them to zero because that's usually the, the thing that will satisfy our constraints most easily. Um, but, you know, if we have a situation like this, okay, where we know from our objective function that if we increase the value for x3, we're going to get a more optimal solution, okay? And then if our other equations are telling us that we can do that without violating the other constraints, then there's nothing stopping us, right? And so, uh, you know, we can go ahead and set x3 to be something infinitely large. We can set it to be you know, uh, 50, instead of be 500, instead of be 5 million, you know, and still have technically a valid solution where each time we increase X3, we get more and more up, okay? And so when you have kind of a problem like this, we say that the solution is unbounded. Okay. 
it's unbounded in the sense that we can improve the objective function, you know, unbounded unboundedly without violating the constraints. Okay. And so this is kind of a special, a special situation. So this this does this doesn't happen that often. It only happens in, in some kind of very niche uh, situations, but you know it's important to kind of recognize when it does. Okay. You want to look for so you want to look for cases where you know everything, all the coefficients for that same variable is negative, then you have an unbounded solution. All right, any questions on, on that? Okay. Uh, question, so can we only make that assumption for an unbounded solution for slack variables? It actually applies for the other variables too. And so, uh, so even for the original design variables, you know, sometimes you might have situations where the original design variables end up being the non-basic variables. Right? And if the, if the uh, original design variables are non-basic, then you can set their value technically to whatever you want. And if all their coefficients are negative, then you can increase it unboundedly. So you know it can apply for it can apply for the original uh, design variables. Good question. All right. Any other questions on on this example? Okay. All right. So let's. Uh, so you know that that actually took longer than I thought. So let's let's go ahead and jump to the homework problem then. So let's let's try problem three B on the homework. I don't think this is a shouldn't be an unbounded one, so this should be fairly. All right, and so in this problem here, we want to maximize. We want to maximize the following functions. We have to maximize f of x one, two, two, five x one, six x two. We have two constraints here, so we have 2x1 minus 3x2 is greater than or equal to 4, x1 plus x2 is less than or equal to 4. Okay, and so this one, this one's going to have one, it should have one unique solution. Granted, I didn't make a mistake in my, in my work anymore. Just may happen. Okay. First thing, step one. Uh, step, well, I should say step zero. Step zero is to get this problem into standard form. Okay. So remember, standard form is to change any maximize operation to minimize. Okay. By multiplying by negative one. Objective function will be f of x1, comma x2, 2 minus 5x1 minus 6x2. Okay. And we're going to change all greater than or equal to uh, operations to less than or equal to by again multiplying by negative one. Subject two. And so we're going to multiply the first uh, uh, constraint there by negative one. So we have minus two x one plus three x two less than or equal to minus four. The second uh, constraint is already just fine, so we're just going to keep it that way. So we have x one plus x two less than or equal to two. So now we're in good shape. Okay, so now everything is in standard form. Okay, let's jump to uh, step one. So step one, step one, let's add our slack variables. So if we add our slack variables, we have minus two x one plus three x two plus x three is equal to minus four. Adding a slack variable to the second equation, we have x1 plus x2 plus x4 equals 
two. Let's uh, look at our objective functions. Our objective function is minus five x one minus six x two f zero. And from this, uh, we can go ahead and find our initial basic solution. So our initial basic solution, we're gonna set our original design variables, x1 and x2, to zero. I see, I see. I see the typo. I must. I must have made already. So I think. I think the. Uh, I think the typo I might have made in, in the in results here, because the. Uh, you know, we we're not we're not going over how to find the initial basic solution. So, I think the initial typo was that instead of the first constraint, the first constraint should be greater than or equal to minus four. So that minus sign should cancel out there. And so you should get the second constraint after you put in standard form. Minus two x one plus three x two is less than or equal to four. There's there's a way to get an initial basic solution from that with the negative with the negative sign on the right hand side, um, you know, but it's you know kind of beyond what we can do uh, in the time we have. So and so this will be fresh, and so you know um, I'll need to update the solution on the on the homework, uh, and you'll see me kind of make one from scratch without uh, without any preparation. Okay. Okay, so here's our initial basic solution. So we have x1 is equal to zero, x2 is equal to zero, x3 is equal to four, okay? and x4 is equal to two. Okay. Here are our non-basic variables. Here are the basic. All right, so let's go to step two. Step two is to uh, see if we can improve our objective function. And so we're going to look at our objective function, which is what we have at the top of the page. And so we have a minus 5x1 minus 6x2 minus f is equal to zero. Okay. And so because both the coefficients here are negative, we can improve it. Okay. And the one that's more negative here is x2. So we know x2 is going to go into the basic set. Step three is to find out which one we should kick out of the, uh, of the basic set. Okay, so let's go ahead. And, I'm going to go ahead and write down our two constraint equations one more time. So we have a minus two x1 plus 3x2 plus x3 that's equal to 4. Our second constraint equation is x1 plus x2 plus x4. That's equal to 2. Right. So first thing we're going to do is uh, we know that x1 is, is not being promoted. And so we can go ahead and just, you know, forget about x1 now. Okay. And so let's go through the two scenarios here where we either set x3 is equal to zero. Okay. If we do that, then we get x2 is equal to four over three. Okay. 
And if we set x4 is equal to zero, then we get x2 equal to two. So the answer here is just is to use the first one because uh, four over three is less than two. Okay. Here we take out x three. Yeah, we 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 uh, we had one example of that last week, and so in that case, you can just flip a coin and say which one. Which one. Okay. So now that we know we we know our um, our, our plan of action here, let's go ahead and and implement it. Okay. So step four is to pivot our pivot our equation around x two. Uh, remember, the, the objective of pivoting is to eliminate it from the other equations. All right, so let me take let me take our x three equation because x three is the one we're going to uh, demote. Okay, x three equation is two x one x two plus three four. Before I solve for x two here, let me go ahead and divide the entire equation by three. So what this is going to do is that it's going to put everything in kind of what, what's called canonical form. It's going to make the math for the next couple steps a uh, lot easier. Okay, so if we divide by three, what we get from this is minus two over three. X one plus x two plus one third three equals four. So this is the first equation in our new system. <clears throat> We're gonna take this equation here and solve it for X2. So if we solve it for X2, we get X2 is equal to four over three plus two thirds X1. One third three. Okay, so let's go ahead and plug this into the other equations. And so we plug this into the other equations. We have uh, our x four equation here: x one plus x two plus x four. Equal to two. So let's go ahead and plug in for x two. We're going to pop that expression right in there. We're going to eliminate x two from that equation. X one plus four over three plus two thirds x one plus one third three plus x four equal to two. We go ahead and, and perform this arithmetic here. And so we have two x1 terms. We're going to combine those together. So we have five over three x1. We have a minus one third x3. It's four going to stay the same. And we're going to subtract four thirds from both sides. And so two thirds minus four thirds.
then finally, we're gonna do the same thing for our objective function. So let's go ahead and look at back at our objective function. Our objective function is minus five X1 minus six X2 minus F. We're gonna plug in for X2. We're gonna have minus five X1, that's the same, minus six times Four over three, that's two thirds, one third, three, F zero. So minus five, X one, uh, minus six times uh, four over three, and so that is minus eight, minus six times two thirds, and so that's minus four, that's one. Minus six times minus one third is two, is three, is F zero. Sure, I did everything correctly. All right, so we simplify. Simplify, we get a minus nine X one plus two X three F. So everything we have circled here is our new set of equations. So now that we're at this point, we can return to step two. And so step two, we're gonna look at our objective function. Okay. And if we look at our objective function, we can see here that we have a negative coefficient. It's gonna make a negative nine X one. And so that means we can improve this this further. Okay, we're going to go through one more one more step, one more uh, one more time around the rodeo, um, and then you know we're done seeing simplex method in the class. Right, um, and this should this should give you the solution for. Okay. Uh, so before before we finish this up, are there any any questions on how we got to this point here? Yes. Uh, because x1, we're, we're still leaving x1 in the non-basic set. And so we're assuming x1 is still equal to zero. And so we just kind of, just to, just to kind of simplify, we just kind of uh, get rid of it. All right, so let's do this one more time. One last time with the simplex method. And then, uh... okay, so from here, we know we want to promote x1 because it has a minus nine in front. Step two taken care of. So let's look at step three A. Step, and so in step three A, we're going to decide which basic variable to pick out. So it's either going to be an X2 or X4. Let's write down those equations again. So the X2 equation is a minus two thirds X1 plus X2 minus one third X3 is equal to four over three. And then our X4 equation is five over three. One. We know that X three is staying in the in the non basic set, so let's go ahead and set that equal to zero. X2 
And then let's look at our two, our two scenarios here, whether we set x2 is equal to zero, x4 is equal to zero. All right, so if we set x2 is equal to zero, uh, setting x2 equal to zero would, would kind of just be going backwards. And so we just, we, we had just promoted x2, but so, sometimes that could be the solution. Sometimes it could be, you know, maybe x1 needs to go in the basic set, but not x2, and that leads to a more optimal solution. But usually that's not the case. Usually, usually if you're going to promote the trouble of promoting a variable, it's usually going to stay. Okay? And so this actually confirms it. And so if we solve for x1 in this case, we have minus two thirds x1 is equal to four over three. And so if we solve for x1, we get a minus two. And if we solve for x1 in the second equation, we have a five thirds x1 is equal to two thirds. Okay. Uh, we solve for x1 here and we get x1 is equal to two. And so, of course, the second option is going to be our only viable one because that's the only one where x1 is non negative. All right, and so let's go ahead and, and finish this up. So we're going to pivot around x1. So let me take our x4 equation and we're going to transform that into our x1 equation. 5 thirds x1 minus 1 third x3. Let's multiply this uh, equation so that the coefficient in front of x1 is equal to 1. Let's multiply. All right, so if you multiply by three fifths, we get x one minus um, one over five three plus three fifths four two over five. Solve this for S one. So if we solve for X one, we get X one is equal to two fifths plus it's X three minus three over five X four. Right. So that second equation there, we're going to plug in. And our first equation there, we're going to, uh, that's going to be our new equation. Very rapidly um, running out of time. So actually, let me let me just do one thing. Because the, the only thing we have to confirm at this point, we have to confirm that our objective function has all positive coefficients. Okay. And so if we did this correctly, if we plug in, and assuming we don't have an unbounded solution, when we plug in that underlying expression back into our objective function, we should see that we have all positive coefficients and all the negative coefficients. Okay, let me let me just do that really quick. And so our objective function at this point is minus nine x one plus two x three f is equal to eight. So let me go ahead and plug in this expression for x one. You have minus nine times two over five. Five minus three minus three over five four plus two x three minus f is equal to eight. All right, and so we multiply this through, we get minus eighteen over five minus nine over five plus three plus twenty seven. Four plus two x three f eight. Look at the coefficient for x four. 
Okay, there's only one X4 term here, and it's a positive 27 over 5. So we're good on the X4 front. Let's check X3. So our coefficients for X3, we have a minus 9 over, 9 over 5 here and a positive 2 here. And so we combine those together, and we're barely on the safe side here. So 2X3 is the same thing as 10 over 5. And so we have a positive 1 fifth X3. The minus 18 over five goes to the other side of the equation. So that one doesn't matter. Okay. And so since our X4 has a positive coefficient, our X3 has a positive coefficient, that will give us, you know, that, that tells us that we can stop here. And so our solution, our final solution to this, uh, to this problem is you know, X1, X1 is equal to two or five, it's two here, I think, which I think is a solution I had on the, on the, oh, there's a, there's a typo on X2, but X2, so X2 should be four over three. So I'll, I'll go ahead and correct that on the, uh, on the homework, just so it's, uh, all right, any questions on, on this or anything else on simplex method? Okay, all right, so that is, that's it. And so that's, so that's a solution to 3B on the homework. So I'll go ahead and correct that tonight uh, after my next class. And so I'll go ahead and send an announcement once that's corrected, okay. Um, so after today, you know, we have, uh, we're not covering any new, any more content on the exam. So this is kind of a cutoff point here, all right? And so, uh, so thank you guys for coming today. Uh, you know, it, it kind of ended up being a more intense day than I thought, um, just because, you know, trying just trying to explain every step in the simplex method. So I appreciate you guys uh, kind of sticking with me. Um, and so if you have any questions leading up to the exam, uh, you know, please let me know. Come to office hours, send me emails, you know, uh, whatever you need. Okay. And uh, I will see you guys on, on Thursday. Get to this. Thanks. So let me pass. I think you stay healthy. Yes. 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 Yeah. Is that the way you have the general one for the whole week? Yeah. If you see negatives, can we skip doing X1, two degrees? Can we just go straight into uh, degree? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I I did I did everything here just to kind of just to kind of talk through all the oh, logic. Okay. But then yeah, that's one thing I want to start doing these more and more. It's already negative. I'm just gonna go ahead and skip it's, to it. Okay. Yeah, you can you can do that. That's that's fine. Okay, yeah, cool. Just wanted to add it. Yeah. All right, thanks. Yep. Do people any uh, any final questions? Okay, all right. I will uh, see you all on Thursday.